received his prize for studying uh, the molecular basis of learning and memory. He's also a psychiatrist. So it's actually very timely uh, at this particular moment uh, for our class. Uh, and he's someone who's going to be, if you look at the title of his lecture, he's going to try to draw linkages between psychiatry and the molecular mechanisms of memory. And so, you know, it's going to be an hour long talk. Our class starts at 11. But I'm going to be there for the first, you know, 25 minutes, try to catch the first part of his talk. I'll stand in the back to not be too uh, disruptive. But if any of you are interested, it'll be kind of a big event, and there'll be a lot of uh, people there. So that's this Thursday. Uh, any announcements from TAs or anything? Creative uh, or logistical? Job on the first day of the group. Yeah, pretty impressive job. Uh, clearly, you guys got into it quite well and did, did an amazing job. So we'll, we'll do the next step of the case study uh, at the end. Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and dive into, uh, we'll wrap up our CNS work that we uh, left in incomplete uh, at the end of the last session, and we'll finish it up. Um, and we want to talk about is the interventions. What's the currently available status of uh, interventions in the central nervous system? Well, it's limited. There's not a lot we can do because we don't understand uh, the system enough because it's fragile. Uh, our tools are, are inadequate. They uh, span things like electroconvulsive therapy to vagus nerve stimulation, transcranial magnetic stimulation, and deep brain stimulation. Huge opportunities for bioengineers on all of these fronts. This uh, you, you know, is commonly known as electroshock therapy. You might have heard about it. It's uh, act actively used at, uh, around the world. Uh, I myself have delivered more than 200 of these treatments. It remains the best treatment for refractory depression, but it is astonishingly uh, crude. Uh, I wish we understood more about how this works. The uh, fact is we don't. Um, but this is what happens. You take a patient, you put uh, an electrode, surface electrode on either temple. Uh, you put them to sleep and you actually paralyze them. You give them a muscle paralytic so their body doesn't move. They can rest peacefully and you give them a seizure. You pass uh, 100 to 500 millicoulombs from one electrode to the other. And there's a huge activation of everything in the brain. Uh, the parasympathetic nervous system is activated. Then the sympathetic nervous system. You have a seizure that lasts for about a minute. Everything changes. There's sprouting of connections. There are uh, neurotransmitters that appear in the cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, there's elevated metabolism, everything happens. We don't know which of these is causal in giving rise to the anti-depressing, anti-depressant effects of electroconvulsive therapy. Uh, every time we try to make it more precise, more limited, more restricted to one part of the brain, it's less effective, okay? So that, unfortunately, is the state of things. Some of the hypotheses, people have thought maybe there's downregulation of neurotransmitter receptors, maybe there's altered blood flow to the frontal lobe. There are some side effects. People are transiently confused, and some people complain of uh, lasting retrograde amnesia. They'll say they can't remember a few months or a year or two of their lives, and that's a, a serious issue. But uh, it's life-saving for many people. <clears throat> you do it three times a week for eight to 12 total treatments. They'll still relapse like any psychiatric uh, treatment. 50 to 80% will relapse within the first uh, six months to a year. You can do what's called continuation ECT, come, have them come by uh, every week, uh, every month even. You can space it out to every three months uh, to maintenance treatment. And again, we don't understand how any of this works. It's purely empirical. Now, there are more precise things that people have tried. Vagus nerve stimulation is kind of interesting. The vagus nerve is the 10th cranial nerve. It runs down both sides of your neck. It innervates your gut, your heart, uh, but it also brings afferents back to the brain. Uh, and those report on uh, the homeostasis of the uh, abdomen and, and thorax. And you can put a little cuff around the vagus nerve right here in the neck. So you can kind of access those afferents that are going back to the brain. And you implant this little controller uh, under the clavicle. And you can control that with a handheld uh, wand, radio frequency interrogator controller, much like a pacemaker. And I have a few patients in my clinic that I, I use this for. But again, we don't know how it works or why it works. It's actually not that effective, to be honest. What's nice about it is how it does let you access the brain uh, without directly going into the brain. And so you avoid brain surgery by using this, uh, this access route. There's a little surgery site in the neck. Uh, it's barely visible. And then a little surgery site uh, uh, under the clavicle. Uh, quantitatively, what does it do? Well, it delivers a, a tiny current 
to the vagus nerve. You pulse it at 20 to 30 hertz. Uh, you leave it on for 30 seconds, then it's off for five minutes. So there's a duty cycle that's just free running around the clock. Uh, it's mostly off. And you elevate uh, it uh, to about probably between two, to hit about two milliamps uh, or until there are side effects. Well, what are the side effects? They're pretty substantial. This is the kind of thing you can see. Alt voice alteration, that's very prominent when it's active. The voice sounds like they're being strangled. It's a very raspy, uh, 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 strangled sort of sound. And so you, someone who has public speaking or uh, in conversation is a normal part of their life. It uh, can be uh, really, you can have cough, you can have neck pain. Dyspnea is difficulty breathing. Dysphagia is difficulty swallowing. Uh, all kinds of other things associated with the spread of the current uh, around the neck. So you're, you've got this uh, current that's being delivered to the vagus nerve, but it's affecting the laryngeal and pharyngeal nerves. And some of those side effects dampen out by uh, 9 to 12 months, but some don't. Um, but how effective is it? Well, it's pretty small. You've got depression rating scales that people use. Uh, you know, this goes down to zero, but just they blew up the 30 to 45 uh, region. The higher you are in this, the more depressed you are. And, you know, they didn't really do a side-by-side -side comparison. This was the pattern, the reduction in the depression score with vagus nerve stimulation in this pivotal study, 205 patients. Uh, but their comparison group also went down. Um, it was statistically different, but this is not a huge effect, you know, difference between 40 and 35 on this uh, depression scale. It's plotted to look big, but it's really not that big. And it, Clinically, it's, uh, it's sort of unsatisfying to use. Many patients don't get better. All right, this is a more interesting one in that it's got maybe a bigger upside, more flexibility. This is transcranial magnetic stimulation. This uh, is also FDA approved for depression. You put the patient in a chair, you bring in a, a coil that looks like this close up, uh, and you can stare tactically, place it over particular parts of the brain. Uh, still outside the brain, over the skull, and the patient is awake and alert. You can do this in your office, and we've done a number of these at Stanford. <clears throat> it uses uh, induction. Uh, you have current that's in this. There are coils uh, of wire, copper wire, inside this uh, uh, little uh, device that comes close to the brain. And what you do is you uh, pass uh, current through it, and that creates a, a magnetic field. And you pulse the current, so it creates a rapidly changing magnetic field. And that, in turn, will induce an electric current in the brain. The rapidly changing magnetic field will penetrate and will change rapidly as, since you're pulsing it, and that will induce a current in the brain. And so the quantitative parameters are pretty interesting here. You have enormous currents going around the coil, uh, thousands of amps, which is pretty remarkable. Magnetic fields that are generated on the order of Tesla, which is amazing for this uh, small device. And you have a rapidly changing B field, small induced currents. The spatial resolution is on the order of uh, centimeters or so. You can't uh, resolve uh, smaller uh, regions than that. Uh, but it's still been useful. Uh, people have used TMS uh, to stimulate peripheral nerves, first of all, but you can also use it centrally. And you can compare motor output with a peripheral versus a central intervention, and that kind of lets you subtract them and see, well, is the, if the patient has a problem in a signal getting from here to motor output, is it more the distal part, the uh, peripheral part, or is there a central component as well? And so you can measure things like the delay, the threshold, and the amplitude of the peripheral response. Yeah. It's not actually. I've done it myself. It's actually kind of interesting. You, you feel a little tapping, a uh, sensation of tapping, and that's due to uh, recruitment of the muscle, the scalp muscle. Um, and if you put it over motor cortex, you can get a, a twitch of the contralateral side. If you put it over occipital cortex, you can see uh, uh, sometimes uh, glowing lights, and so that's kind of fun. For depression, we, we, we put it over the frontal part. This is actually kind of interesting, though. So over motor cortex, you get twitches. You put it over the whole frontal part of your brain, which is involved in planning and, and motivation and hope. It's kind of an interesting question to ask. What do you experience when you're doing that? And the answer is nothing. So I've done it to myself. I just I can't. There's no, uh, upon introspection, there's no subjective sense uh, at all. And yet that's the area that we target for depression. So kind of interesting. Uh, again. We don't know enough to apply this uh, in an intelligent way. We don't know the right pulse pattern. We don't know the right location. We just generally apply it to this area because we think that's involved in motivation. And hope. But a huge upside, if we understood uh, much about the brain, we could be much more precise about what we're doing.
And you can recruit, even though the, the magnetic field doesn't penetrate uh, uh, as deep as you'd like, it drops off with uh, between a cube and a square law. You actually, of course, everything in the brain is connected, and so you can actually recruit deep structures by recruiting surface structures. The final interventional technique to highlight is uh, deep brain stimulation, and this is where you just jam an electrode in the brain. So this is brain surgery, it's invasive, um, but it actually works. It works for Parkinsonism. About half the patients who have Parkinson's, deep brain stimulation to the subthalamic nucleus uh, is very powerful in, in resolving aspects of tremor uh, and uh, bradykinesia or slow movement. It also works for depression, at least uh, it's thought to. Uh, there was a report in 2005 which was uh, buttressed by follow-up work from Helen Mayberg and colleagues where they targeted the subgenual cingulate gyrus. It's a, it's a frontal region, but it's a, a slightly deep structure. And they introduced an electrode. And just, this is the electrodes, they're 1.2 millimeter in diameter electrodes and they just brought them in bilaterally and just cored everything out on the way down. So it's pretty crude and obviously you're only gonna do this for pretty severely depressed patients who are treatment resistant. But they did it, they hit the sub bilateral uh, structure, the subgenual cingulate, and it was exactly the region they wanted in the sagittal section, it's this little, toward the front. And the patients had uh, pronounced uh, effects, they felt, uh, calmer, lighter, they had reduced sensation of emptiness or a void, they felt more connected, they had more planning and uh, motivated activity. And th that helped for more than six months and this was supported by uh, PET imaging studies. So remember our discussion of uh, PET. Uh, in Helen Mayberg's earlier work, she had found that this subgenual cingulate structure was uh, hyperactive in depression at, at baseline. This is cerebral blood flow as measured by PET, all patients versus normal controls. And the regions that are increased are shown in red, and you can see that in the sagittal versus coronal section, increased subgenual cingulate or CG25 activity. And then the patients who uh, responded at three months showed decreased activity there, and that was maintained at six months. So it's an interesting way to correlate uh, a brain imaging with uh, treatment response. Now, it doesn't always uh, work, and some follow-up Studies have not been as promising as the first one, but still it shows the potential and again, a deeper understanding will be uh, crucial. Um, so that's our sort of central nervous system overflow uh, from last time. I just wanted to give you the state of the art in terms of intervention right now. Any questions on that or on central nervous system uh, in general? Yeah, so any, any foreign object inserted into the brain will cause local uh, gliosis, which is a proliferation of the glial cells, and it's effectively a scar. And it's thought that that is why deep brain stimulation stops working after about a year or so. Um, but there are all kinds of tissue responses that might be uh, therapeutic or helpful too, and we don't know which of those are helpful and which are harmful. Okay, so peripheral nervous system is interesting because it's more accessible. Okay, so we have a greater opportunity maybe to build devices and test them sooner uh, with a higher throughput. And so we'll talk about the peripheral nerves and the diseases and the regeneration uh, strategies as well as the instrumentation. So the peripheral nervous system is everything that's not the central nervous system. Central nervous system is uh, the brain and spinal cord. Everything downstream of the spinal cord, nerves going out to the muscles and coming in from the skin and so on are the peripheral nervous system. Uh, as you know already, uh, a neuron consists of a cell body which has dendrites where incoming information is, uh, is received and an outgoing axon uh, and axon terminals that synapse on the next cell downstream. And it's coated by this myelin sheath uh, which uh, has properties that accelerate uh, conduction speed. So an axon in cross section looks a bit, little bit like this. It's uh, got the actual uh, fiber coming from the cell and then it's coated with this uh, myelin structure, which is actually created by a support cell uh, called a Schwann cell. Uh, now, there are both unmyelinated and myelinated fibers. Uh, vertebrates have both. Uh, unmyelinated fibers uh, tend to be smaller, slower, uh, used for tasks that are not as time sensitive. Uh, the myelinated ones uh, are, can be quite large, up to 22 microns thick, and they have this uh, thick uh, layer of fat around them. Um, and those are separated though by what are called nodes of Ranvier where that insulating layer is broken up and that at each of those nodes 
uh, which are spaced, uh, there's a high density of sodium and potassium channels that create and regenerate the action potential at each step along the way. Now, this, this uh, prevents a loss of the membrane potential. It also speeds conduction because by separating the charge across the membrane, uh, it actually reduces the capacitance of the axon. By reducing the capacitance of the axon, you reduce the time taken needed to charge up uh, the axon. And, and there, therefore, you accelerate the speed of conduction of the action potential down the So uh, pretty amazing speeds can be achieved getting to more than 100 uh, meters uh, per second. And that's particularly useful. We have very long axons that, for example, that go from our spinal cord all the way down uh, to our, our legs and, and those uh, are very uh, uh, important uh, in terms of maintaining balance. Uh, the way we maintain balance actually is our most time sensitive task and those are the most uh, heavily uh, myelinated fibers. They have rapid feedback to help uh, keep uh, your, uh, your posture. Uh, so what is an action potential? Well, it looks like this. It's got, it's a little blip, goes up, undershoots, and then returns back to normal. It lasts for about a millisecond. It's about 100 millivolts uh, uh, in amplitude. And it, in the peripheral nervous system, its goal is to get to the presynaptic terminal, release a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine, which then acts on postsynaptic receptors. The acetylcholine receptor, uh, when it binds acetylcholine, opens a pore that allows sodium ions to rush in. That depolarizes the cell. It allows calcium in. It allows muscle contraction to happen. Now, if you notice, potassium also leaves. It's a non-selective cation channel. Uh, it doesn't flux calcium, actually, but it does allow sodium and potassium to go through uh, equally. Now, um, those ions are going down their electrochemical gradients. And those gradients are set up in an energy-intensive way. And this uh, is the sodium-potassium pump that sets up those gradients. It pumps uh, sodium out, and it pumps sodium in. You get three sodiums out for every two potassiums in, and it uses an ATPase for each one of those. It uses an ATP for each one of those cycles. So this is a huge uh, energetic cost to maintain these gradients, uh, but that creates the capability for uh, uh, dynamics. Uh, when the pore opens, these ions run down their gradients, and that creates the depolarization that's needed. To... Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, sodium is pumped out, and potassium is pumped in. Okay. That creates a, a basal state where sodium is very low inside the cell and uh, potassium is high. And actually, these numbers are pretty useful uh, to keep in mind. This helps it all make sense. Uh, we don't think, in most cases, it's important to memorize things. These are extremely helpful numbers to know, though. Uh, all of neural and muscular and cardiac physiology makes a lot more sense if you know these numbers. Okay, So I would actually recommend knowing these. Uh, potassium is high inside the cell. It's low outside, 140 versus 4 millimolar. Chloride, it's the opposite. Sodium, it's the opposite. Calcium, there's a huge gradient. Actually, um, this is a typo, though. This should be 0.1 micromolar, or about 100 nanomolar uh, inside, but still very low. So that should be a micromolar instead of a nanomolar. But it's about 1.6 millimolar outside. So you have a very, very remarkable uh, calcium uh, gradient as well. And the um, what's called the reversal potential for an ion is the membrane potential at which, if there were an open pore, there would be no net movement of the ion. That's the reversal potential indicated as E. And you can calculate that with something called the Nernst equation. And so uh, what this captures is the fact that there's an electrochemical gradient. If there's a, a chemical gradient, a higher concentration on one side than the other, the ion will tend to run down its concentration gradient unless there's an opposing electrical gradient. And so inside of the cell is typically very negative. That's in part set up by this uh, ATPase. And so that's going to balance at some point with the chemical gradient. You'll have this uh, integrative uh, electrochemical gradient. And you can calculate the reversal potential. Uh, there's an RT factor, the uh, R constant, uh, T absolute temperature, and Z is the charge of the ion, and F is the Faraday constant. And the natural log of the concentration of the ion outside compared to the ion inside gives you a reversal potential. So useful numbers uh, to know. So how, did, how does this then turn into an action potential? Well, this is classic work uh, dating back to Hodgkin and Huxley in the uh, 50s and 60s. 
they did experiments with the squid giant axon where they uh, were able to control or clamp membrane voltage and see what happened to ion flow at different uh, membrane potentials. And you could do things like uh, delivering a 20 millivolt step, voltage step to the inside of an axon. Now normally, uh, if you do that, what happens is there's your initial step and then the action potential will take off after that. You'll have a responsive further depolarization or membrane potential change that happens as a result of your initial trigger. And so that gives rise to an action potential. Now why does that happen? Well, because there's ion flow that happens and because ion channels are voltage dependent. They're molecularly set up to be uh, voltage dependent in how they open and close. And so that initial voltage step that the experimenter is giving uh, then creates this influx of sodium through voltage gated sodium channels. And uh, that uh, reaches a peak and then Sodium channels have fast inactivation that happens and they start to turn off uh, and that terminates the flow of sodium. But you also notice something happening with a slight delay. There's a potassium flux as well and that's happening because this rise in membrane voltage that's driven in part by the sodium is then opening slightly slower but still pretty fast voltage dependent potassium channels. When they open, uh, potassium starts to leave and that has a countervailing influence and that helps bring the membrane voltage back to its uh, negative or hyperpolarized uh, state. And so that's, that's the action potential, mostly controlled by sodium and potassium. Some tissues like heart and in some neurons, uh, a flow of calcium supports the overall sodium uh, effect and you have even calcium dependent action potentials. The directionality and the logic is the same. There are voltage dependent calcium channels which serve that function. So that's your action potential and then uh, if zooming back out to look at the intact uh, uh, axon state, you have these uh, uh, sodium and potassium channel uh, clusters that lead to the initiation of action potentials and then in a myelinated uh, axon you have that only operative at these nodes. Uh, everything else is completely insulated. You have very low capacitance here, the action potential zips down here with no loss, very high speed. Uh, but there's a little bit of loss and so the action potential gets regenerated at these uh, nodes. End result is you got an action potential or spike that hits the presynaptic terminal. And here you have vesicles containing acetylcholine that are primed and ready to go and there are voltage dependent calcium channels that sense that action potential that comes down and hits the terminal. They open, release calcium, calcium comes in activates fusion of the vesicle with the presynaptic membrane. And the guy who figured this out, Tom Sudhoff, here at Stanford, just won the Nobel Prize for that last year for, for, for sorting all that out. And uh, that leads to release of neurotransmitter into the presynaptic cleft where it diffuses across, activates the postsynaptic receptors. And those then uh, allow uh, sodium and potassium and also indirectly calcium to come in and that triggers muscle contraction. We'll talk more about muscle contraction that's the basics of the peripheral nervous system uh, um, axonal uh, firing and we'll talk about how to modulate that and how it goes wrong in disease states. So that's uh, sort of the basic uh, function and so now let's get into discussion of the disease questions that uh, kind of illustrate the, the key principles of function. Um, and so we'll focus on three relating to cells, wiring, and synaptic terminals, three classes of disorder. The first one is uh, amyotrophic lateral uh, sclerosis, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, Steve Hawking, a famous uh, sufferer of, of that disorder. And uh, this uh, highlights this upper motor neuron versus lower motor neuron distinction. The upper motor neurons live in the brain and project down to the spinal cord where they make synapses on cells that live in the spinal cord but then project out to uh, the uh, body. And the upper motor neurons and the lower, mo lower motor neurons uh, are altered in different disease states. Uh, ALS happens to affect both. But it's best known for affecting the, uh, uh, the lower motor neurons, those that live in the spine and project to uh, muscle. Um, but it's, it's interesting because there are, you know, 
Stephen Hawking, for example, is a good example. There are upper motor neurons that affect the facial musculature and the regulation of affect or the appearance of emotion. And those are also altered in ALS. They can create sort of these syndromes of inappropriate smiling or even laughter uh, that are not really uh, reporting a true subjective state but are dysregulated activity uh, of upper motor neurons. Lower motor neurons also are dysregulated. They're both weak and inappropriately active. And uh, that is illustrated here. You end up getting uh, diseased or defective uh, spinal neurons. They start to lose uh, their uh, efficacy of connection with the muscle. They withdraw and pull back uh, some of the uh, 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 presynaptic terminals. You also get loss of upper motor neurons as well. Um, Early signs include uh, fibrillations. These are um, sort of uh, rapid pulsatile contractions of small muscles. You can experience those in upper uh, limbs, lower limbs, or, or eyelids. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and so those early signs of fibrillations are, are due to the fact that the um, the muscles themselves, in many cases, are becoming hyperactive. If you withdraw the innervation of a muscle, it's not getting its normal directed or controlled uh, uh, stimulation. And so what muscles do is they tend to uh, increase their activity level, increase the expression of acetylcholine receptors, increase their excitability so much so, uh, as, almost as if they're looking for something to be active in, some situating situation to be active in, that they start to spontaneously become active and, and fibrillate. Uh, but also you get less effective directed or, or, or CNS driven control. Uh, and so you get a, a weakness and an uncoordination. Um, and that, as it becomes progressive, leads to even difficulty breathing and ultimately, uh, in cases, death. By the way, this voluntary control of facial expression I mentioned earlier, that's called pseudobulbar uh, palsy. The uh, causes are not fully understood. Uh, it's mostly a spontaneous disease. Uh, it can happen to anybody. Uh, is it a virus? Is it a toxin? Is it an exposure to heavy metal autoimmune? We don't know. It's mostly sporadic. There are familial cases, though, and they've given us uh, some insight. Twenty percent of all familial cases, which are a tiny fraction of the overall, are due to deficiencies in the superoxide dismutase gene. And this is a gene that helps uh, effectively detoxify uh, oxygen radicals, superoxides, that can be damaging or toxic to DNA and proteins. Now, what's interesting is that neural activity itself can elevate these superoxides. It can elevate uh, uh, the redox potential of cells. You can end up creating oxidative damage just through high levels of activity. And this is uh, perhaps understandable. The very fact that a cell is highly active means you've got a lot of um, metabolism that's going on. You've got to keep restoring your gradients with the ATPases, for example, uh, and so you've got to pump all the ions back out. Also, some uh, uh, ions, particularly uh, calcium ions that come into cells, can be uh, a, a toxic as well and can lead to uh, oxidative damage uh, through indirect mechanisms. So maybe there's an elevated activity level that leads to toxicity, and supporting that, uh, there are medications that are used for ALS that involve blocking uh, certain kinds of glutamate receptors, like the NMDA receptors that we'll get to uh, in a minute. That's a, a great question. Yes, you can see spontaneous, uh, non-familial but sporadic mutations of this gene, but you also see uh, many other mutations as well. But it, it, then it's a tiny minority. It's in fact we don't know most of the causes for sporadic. So uh, the NMDA receptor is a glutamate receptor. It's a it's a synaptic receptor like the acetylcholine receptor that's on muscle, except the, these glutamate receptors are on neurons, and they receive glutamate as a neurotransmitter, and they open much like the acetylcholine receptor. They allow sodium to come in, and they allow potassium to leave, but they have this additional calcium permeability, which the acetylcholine receptor doesn't have. They let calcium come into cells, and that heightens the metabolic demand on the cell. The cell now has to pump out all this calcium as well, and calcium itself can be toxic in some ways. And so some of the therapies for ALS, which are not great, 
when we have a tiny effect on the clinical course, uh, are blockers of the NMDA receptor. Yohan Barre, this is a pretty interesting one. This is a reversible demyelination of peripheral nerves. Okay, really a fascinating, terrifying course initially. Uh, you get someone coming in who uh, has rapidly gotten weaker, maybe even having trouble breathing. Uh, looks like everything's uh, just uh, spiraling into disaster. Uh, typically follows a bacterial infection. And what's thought to happen is that the immune system is fooled into attacking myelin because there's a molecular mimicry. There's something on the myelin that looks like something that was on the bacterium. Uh, for example, it's lipopolysaccharides, components of its uh, coating. And immune cells, which we'll get into in more detail, uh, become fooled and end up making, uh, for example, antibodies that attack uh, neurons and attack uh, 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 myelin more particularly. In fact, it's the Schwann cell that's a more typical target. You end up with loss of myelin due to damage to the Schwann cell. Um, the neuron is under attack in some indirect sense. It's no longer able to conduct its uh, action potential effectively. But what's great about this disorder is the neuron's not dead. It's not even in itself damaged. And if, if there's a supportive care given, and these patients can, in some cases, require mechanical ventilation uh, to allow them to continue breathing. But eventually, uh, this immune system flare-up dies down. Myelin is recreated. The Schwann cell re-insulates the peripheral nerves. And everything goes completely back to normal, which is amazing. Uh, sometimes you can accelerate the recovery by infusing what's called IVIG. This is uh, just a a very dense cocktail of human antibodies or immunoglobulins, which might help uh, effectively uh, distract or saturate this immune system attack uh, uh, away from the antibodies that are stuck to the uh, myelin or the Schwann cell. So that's a pretty interesting one. Nice, but re uh, you know, serious but reversible. Uh, some of the more difficult ones include uh, myasthenia gravis, which is disorder of the neuromuscular junction. Pretty rare, uh, uh, but in aggregate, there's probably 30 to 40,000 people in the US who have this. And it starts with uh, a uh, sort of a specific muscle weakness that patients report on, usually uh, in the uh, ocular uh, muscles, eyelids, or the muscles that control eye motion. So you can end up getting double vision or, or drooping eyelids. And this also is an autoimmune disease. It's caused by antibodies against uh, the postsynaptic acetylcholine receptor. For some reason, the immune system starts making antibodies that attack this postsynaptic receptor. And that has a number of effects. Uh, you can, therefore, uh, inhibit the ability of the acetylcholine receptors to respond to acetylcholine to open. And uh, you end up with muscle weakness as a result. The presynaptic terminal is perfectly fine. Acetylcholine is being released, but you're having a reduced response. And you can look for antibodies against the receptor. Uh, there are uh, uh, standardized uh, now methods for measuring uh, immunoreactivity from the patient's serum against uh, the acetylcholine receptor. And you can treat that uh, for acute flare-ups with pyridostigmines. Uh, these block the acetylcholine esterase, the enzyme that lives in the synaptic cleft and breaks down acetylcholine. And so you end up having stronger and longer uh, pulses of acetylcholine, which helps to partially uh, compensate for the fact that you've got a uh, partially inactivated uh, population of acetylcholine receptors. Um, also, addressing the immune system with steroid immunosuppressants can be helpful as well. Yeah, it actually could. Um, uh, I don't know off the top of my head if that's widely used. Any of our other folks know uh, if IVIG is used for myasthenia? The reason it's, it's used for Guillain-Barre is that's such a, a life-threatening thing. Myasthenia gravis is, is uh, uh, you know, in the, in the long run can be quite debilitating, but you don't have these acute life-threatening uh, uh, issues. Um, and IVIG comes with its own side effects. You can have a reaction to the IVIG. So but it's a, it's a great thought. It, it, it definitely is worth trying. The flip side of, of myasthenia gravis is Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome. Um, and this is when antibodies to the presynaptic terminal are uh, generated, again, for often mysterious reasons. Um, but often not. Sometimes you can trace it to a particular cause, which I'll tell you about in a moment. <laughs> 
But the voltage-gated calcium channels that I mentioned that live in the presynaptic terminal and open to allow calcium in and allow vesicle fusion, uh, they can fall under <coughs> attack by antibodies. Um, so the prosynaptic membrane is fine. It's the presynaptic membrane that's impaired, and you have reduced uh, acetylcholine release. Here, uh, you tend to have more diffuse muscle weakness. Patients complain of fatigue, uh, malaise, uh, dry mouth. Uh, there can be autonomic dysfunction like uh, impotence or other uh, uh, sort of autonomic uh, processes as well as voluntary muscle control. And again, you test this by looking in the serum for antibodies against voltage-gated calcium channels. Now, uh, about half of the patients will have an underlying cancer that was not previously known. Amazing thing. So what's going on there? Why does that happen? Well, some of these cancers may end up, for a variety of reasons, expressing or making abnormal proteins. That's certainly a feature of cancers that they uh, will ex uh, have dysregulated transcriptional uh, expression of genes, some that are useful for the cancer to propagate and so are selected for as cancers develop and evolve. And voltage-gated calcium channels are important in proliferation and in differentiation, and you can get abnormal expression of voltage-gated calcium channels in some cancers, particularly these small cell lung cancers. And so then, even though the immune system um, Normally, uh, it does not attack these native voltage-gated calcium channels. Now it's seeing them in a new context, in the setting of uh, an invasive tissue disruptive process, and that can end up triggering uh, the immune system to attack the voltage-gated calcium channels, which is then bad for your pre -synaptic. Yes, yes. So this is uh, absolutely the case. If you can eradicate the cancer, uh, then the symptoms go away. Uh, along uh, the path, though, to finding the cancer and taking it out, you'll want to ameliorate the symptoms. And so one interesting thing you can do is block potassium channels. Now, potassium channels, if you remember, they bring the membrane potential back at the end of each action potential. If you impair their function, then you've got a longer action potential. Action potentials are broadened, which means more opportunity for calcium to come in through those channels that are still present or, or active. That ends up uh, uh, reducing some of the symptoms. In, in. Okay, so different steps along the pathway. You get these very characteristic diseases. Um, that helps us understand the uh, core function of these structures. Then, of course, you've got trauma. You've got mechanical disruptions, severing, uh, uh, and uh, you know. Uh, very uh, rapidly uh, uh, progressive uh, autoimmune effects also that can damage uh, neurons and require regeneration or, or grafting strategies. So we'll talk about those next. Uh, regeneration in the peripheral nervous system, how engineers can uh, actually carry out interventions to help uh, regrowth of axons. Now, sometimes there'll be a simple transection, you know, an accidental knife wound, uh, and if it's clean, if it's uh, well localized. You can do relatively simple stitching. You try to align these bundles of axons within the overall peripheral nerve. You can actually just kind of look at it and see these bundles, which are called fascicles. You can uh, sew, basically sew it back together. Sew back the fascicles, sew back the overall nerve, and peripheral nervous system axons will regrow. They'll grow all the way back to their target muscle. They'll find the right muscle, and they'll re it. They regrow at about one millimeter a day. Central nervous system axons do not do this. It's actually thought that the CNS astrocytes actually actively impair the process of regrowth. And some classic studies have been carried out showing this, transplanting central nervous system astrocytes into peripheral nervous system grafts, and that prevents the regrowth of these peripheral nervous system axons. Um, eventually, they get there, uh, and this is just a, a diagram illustrating the uh, regrowth of uh, axons across the, uh, the cell bundle. Now, sometimes, it, yeah. Yeah, good question. Why is this? And it's, it's not an accident. It's a very active process. The CNS astrocytes are very clearly uh, very effective and efficient at preventing regrowth. Any ideas on that? Why would there be this active impairment of regrowth? In the 
Nobody really knows, but there's a lot of interesting speculation. Yeah, I think that's probably right. Uh, you know, the, the central nervous system is, is a pretty amazing thing, and it's very tightly balanced in a number of ways. Uh, you know, a, a, a slight regrowth, an over-exuberant regrowth to a muscle just means that muscle is a little more strongly recruited. A, an over-exuberant regrowth in the brain could lead to seizures, um, could lead to um, you know, uh, more global behavioral disruptions that are fatal to the, to the animal. And so actually, I, uh, it's probably the case that there's an evolutionary calculation there that it's okay to suffer small focal dysfunction. Uh, Eliminate the risk of a more global um, Now, sometimes the disruption is is uh, large enough. It's not clean. There's damage in between, so you actually need to help the regrowth happen. And so there are various kinds of bridges or conduits that you can create. Uh, and this is an active area of biomedical research. You can actually use autologous tissue, meaning tissue from the patient. And you can take that from veins, from muscle. You can take neural sheaths uh, from other nerves that uh, are intact. You can even use tendons, and you can try to create uh, bridging structures or conduits that uh, uh, can be sewn into either end of the graft and help the axons grow across. Take that from the patient, uh, and that prevents uh, autoimmune interactions. You can also do transplants from other individuals. These are non-autologous, so not from the patient. But from someone else. You can reduce immune reactions by making them acellular, so you can actually use their physical form but digest away or, or remove the cells themselves. Or you can give immunosuppressants uh, to the patient and that helps the, the graft uh, uh, survive. You can also use materials, uh, biomaterials of various kinds that are natural. You can use collagen, laminin, extracellular matrix, matrix type proteins, and you can actually build grafts from that. And then finally, there are synthetic materials, purely synthetic materials. Um, you know, uh, polylactic uh, co-glycolic co co acid, PLGA, is widely used, uh, polyolactic acid. Um, and this is, um, all these sorts of uh, conduits can be coupled with other kinds of interventions. You could include support cells that secrete growth factors that facilitate axon growth. Uh, you could have electrical activity that might uh, stimulate growth. This is not known uh, uh, to be effective, but might be. You could have interluminal channels, which might help guide subsections, uh, much like your different uh, fascicles of your, of your nerves in the native uh, uh, axon bone. And this is an example of some of these uh, foam polyolactic acid uh, nerve guidance channels that are implanted and facilitate growth in uh, rat models, rat sciatic nerves. That can help. You can make them biodegradable or not in uh, active area of research. Now, what if you wanted to come in and control the axons? What if you wanted to deliver electrical pulses? Maybe you want to provide a uh, stimulus to facilitate function. And so you can actually build into your cuff or your channel electrodes. And uh, you know this then raises this question, is there any way to selectively stimulate individual kinds of axons within the bundle? And this becomes a really acute challenge within any peripheral nerve. There, first of all, there are nerves going both ways. There are afferents and efferents. So there are nerves going out that control motion. There are nerves coming back that carry sensation. And so that's, that's one problem. And then all the ones that are controlling sensation, well, there's a huge variety of those. There are pain neurons. There are fine touch sensation, vibration sensation. If you just stimulate everything in a peripheral nerve, you could be causing you know, pain. You could be causing uh, coarse movements, fine movements, uh, you know, total chaos. How, how could you come in and just control a subset of those fibers? Broad general question. Any, any sort of ideas or thoughts? Uh, what, what kinds of things might allow you to, to pick out subsets of axons? They're all intermixed as they are within the nerves. Possible. Interesting. So you'd have some closed loop. So maybe tied to a motion, you detect 
like a, a spike pattern that was closely tied to movement, and then you'd know that those were the movement axons, and then you would maybe focally stimulate that region where you detected those, something like that, yeah. Oh, okay, and then, okay, so that's also interesting. So you could either selectively stimulate that one or selectively non-stimulate it by delivering a pulse very soon after it fired when it was refractory but the others were not. Yeah, you could imagine closed loop systems like that. It's actually a big challenge. Uh, there are, um, electrically it's very hard. The one trend that's known is that um, the larger diameter fibers are more sensitive. They can be triggered more easily, um, which is actually kind of backwards from the way you want uh, things to happen. Those larger axons trigger, recruit many what are called motor units, large areas of muscle. They're involved in force movements. And so, but when you're trying to give just a very small stimulus to cause a tiny movement, you're actually going to be selectively recruiting those big coarse movement fibers first. So you end up, instead of having the ability to, you know, pick up something fine, you have a very, very ballistic uh, uh, coarse movement. So that's been a real problem. Um, and th the reason for that is not fully understood, but it's thought that uh, you need a very steep electric field uh, gradient. Um, what really happens is you're triggering a, a circuit uh, between nodes of Ranvier, and you don't want the two nodes to be at the same potential as a result of your stimulation or you won't get current flow. So you need steep field uh, gradients. Now, nodes of Ranvier are more widely spaced in larger diameter axons, and so it becomes easier to recruit them because their nodes are widely spaced and even a more shallow field gradient will recruit them. Um, and these big efferent motor fibers that control coarse movements are 10 to 20 microns in diameter. The good thing is you're not going to recruit the pain fibers, which are very small and thin. So you actually can control movements without causing pain by using low uh, intensity stimulation. Still though, that's the one sort of trend we have in terms of electrodes. A lot of different cuffs have been made, uh, you know, uh, arrays of electrodes that you can stick into nerves and neural tissue and stimulate them. Um, there are uh, conduits that have electrodes built in. This is one designed by a bioengineering uh, professor here, uh, Greg Kovacs, uh, and his group. Um, but electrodes are fundamentally limited, bottom line, as they can't really get the level of selectivity that we'd like. Now, uh, we'll do instrumentation, then we'll get right to our fascinating case study at the end. So how can we come in and intervene uh, with the current state of clinical care? The devices I've shown you so far are mostly for research. What's the current active clinical use for peripheral nervous system? Well, electromyography, EMG, very widely used. Um, it's used for diagnosis, primarily. Um, very simple surface recording electrodes that are made by Medtronic. Sometimes you can have penetrating electrodes if you need very precise uh, uh, recording from a particular muscle. Um, but you can, for example, there's a nerve, the median nerve, which runs down the arm. This is what's uh, frequently damaged in carpal tunnel syndrome. There's a little tunnel of, of, that runs through fibrous tissue in the wrist called the carpal tunnel, and the median nerve can be disrupted in that. And you can assess disruptions in median nerve function. Uh, you can record with surface electrodes over the uh, thenar muscles, the muscles in the, uh, that control the thumb, and you can stimulate at various upstream. And you can measure the latency and the amplitude of the muscle response. And that's incredibly helpful. Let's go back to Guillaume Barre. What do you see if you do that? Well, uh, what you can do is measure things like the distal latency, the latency to recording that uh, electrical response in the uh, muscle of the thumb. And you can also measure the amplitude of the compound muscle action potential, CMAP. And this is what it normally looks like, and also after recovery, you get, uh, there's a short latency, 4.9 milliseconds to the onset of this muscle action potential. Uh, and in acute Guillain-Barre, you actually get a much greater distal latency, and the amplitude of the resulting action potential is spread out and uh, reduced amplitude. So this is characteristic of the demyelination that happens in 
Guillain Barre. You've got reduced myelin, you've got slower conduction. It's highly variable. It's not that the muscle itself is damaged. So one question is, well, you know, why is the muscle action potential lower? Well, the answer is it's involved, it's kind of like a pull of all the muscles, first of all. Some of them are not getting their spikes at all because the spike has, has failed and died out, but also because there's highly variable conduction now among all the different axons that subserve the muscle. You've spread out the action potential. The spikes are arriving at different times and the net amplitude at any, at the peak uh, is reduced for that reason. This is a characteristic pattern for a peripheral nervous system demyelinating disorder. Uh, increased distal latency, reduced compound muscle. Now, um, that's what, you know, we can see for pure demyelination, Guillain-Barre, decreased conduction velocity, decreased compound muscle action potential, increased distal latency. See something totally different with upper motor neurons, like a stroke, everything's completely normal. Okay, so this can really help. Someone comes in with uh, uh, weakness. You do the EMG studies, and it's completely normal. That turns your attention to the central nervous system. What's going on uh, centrally that could be wrong? And then you can get, uh, with neuromuscular junction disorders, you get a, a different pattern. You get normal conduction for velocity and distal latency, right? Because the nerves themselves are fine. So the speed at which the action potential gets down the axon is unchanged. But then things right at the muscle are altered. You've got impaired release uh, of neurotransmitter or impaired acetylcholine action, and you have reduced uh, uh, muscle action potential. Very helpful diagnostically. You can also come in and stimulate with some of these uh, transcutaneous electrodes. These are called TENS units. Um, not completely clear how useful they are. They can help people who have some peripheral pain syndromes. You just hold it over the uh, painful area. People who have diabetic neuropathy, for example, this can help, or lower back pain. Uh, <coughs> some of the parameters of the pulses are shown here. Uh, it's they, not completely clear how this works. It might stimulate release of endorphins. It might effectively just distract the patient from the pain. Um, and so that's an interesting avenue for control. There is another avenue for control which is not yet in clinical practice, uh, but I'll tell you a little bit about it. It's what our, our group is known for working on, and this is something we call optogenetics. So electrodes, if you put them into neural tissue, you can't discriminate different kinds of cells. You can stimulate everything that's nearby, but you have no cell type resolution. With optogenetics, what we do is we confer light sensitivity onto neurons, which are normally not light sensitive at all, and we do that by bringing uh, light-activated ion channels and pumps that we get from microbial organisms like algae that make light-activated regulators of ion flow. And we put those under genetic control uh, and we introduce those into the targeted neurons. And then we can bathe the whole tissue or the whole nerve in light, but only the cells that we've made light-sensitive will respond. And you can turn on or turn off using optogenetic exciters or inhibitors. So that affords the possibility for selective control Kind of cool what these uh, proteins are, are look like. These are called opsins, and they're seven transmembrane proteins, just like G-protein coupled receptors, except uh, they form a dimer. And if you turn it on its end and you look, there's actually a pore uh, through which ions can flow, and they flow in a, a light-regulated way. And we've found a huge diversity of these different opsins. They respond to all different colors of light, as shown here, and they've got all kinds of kinetic properties operating from millisecond scale to 30 minutes or so, and so you can pick the one you want based on the genetics of the sort of response you want. But the neat thing about these is it's just a single gene that controls both light sensation and ion flow, so it's very easy to deliver. Just one gene, you don't need to add chemicals. They're from biology, so they use well-tolerated wavelengths and intensities of light, uh, and they're very fast. And here, capitalizing on millions of years of evolution, nature has built these to be low noise, low dark activity, and fast responses, um, and big spectral diversity. And, and so this is kind of interesting, but first question is how do you get light in? Well, you can use fiber optics to get light in. And so uh, this is the scattering problem. Light is heavily scattered in neural tissue, and this is due to the refractive index changes between lipid and water. And 
this is, if you just focus down here, this is the drop off of light power density as a function of depth in tissue. And you're down to 1 percent, this is a log scale, you're down to 1 percent of your initial irradiance values by the time you're just 1 millimeter deep in tissue. So you can't just apply surface light, um, but you can put in a fiber optic. And so we built fiber optic probes that these are even thinner than the deep brain stimulation electrodes that are used in patients. They can be 200 control neural circuits with uh, very high precision. You can stick electrodes on them as well. So this is a fiber optic and cross section, 200 microns in diameter, but we've put on uh, electrodes as well so we can both record and generate a closed loop uh, stimulation device. Pretty light. They weigh less than two grams and freely running mouse can carry them. So, and the last thing before we get uh, toward the case study, this is a very recent uh, set of work that uh, um, was initiated by uh, Scott Delp and his colleagues and we helped out on the study. But they did a peripheral nervous system intervention. They made peripheral axons in the sciatic nerve light sensitive with a channel rhodopsin, one of these blue light activated <coughs> excitatory channels. And they coupled it to a yellow fluorescent protein so you can see these axons in cross section that are going to be light sensitive inside the overall nerve. And they did some interesting studies. So they took a animal and they put a optical cuff, basically LED cuff, around the peripheral nerve. And now you can start to see how you might selectively recruit a subset of fibers within the axon if you can guide the expression of the channel rhodopsin to a subset of those cells. If you just take control mice, you can give an electrical stimulation, you see a nice EMG response, nice force generation by the muscle. Uh, blue light alone in control animals doesn't do anything. But then if you have these animals that have the channel rhodopsin in the peripheral nerves, you can see nice EMG responses to light and force generation response to light. And amazingly, the light response, because it doesn't rely on this uh, uh, generation of node to node uh, current flow, but directly induces a spike uh, in the uh, target axon, it recruits the small fibers first, which is what we call orderly recruitment a completely the opposite order of recruitment that electrical stimulation generates. And so that is pretty interesting. That allows you to achieve fine control. Also, it greatly reduces fatigue. And so because you tend to recruit these large, fast fatiguing fibers first with electrical stimulation, you get very rapid drop off in the muscle tension that's generated uh, over time. But the optical approach is much more uh, stable, much more fatigue resistant. And recently, another group, not involving either uh, Scott's group or myself, but Scott wrote a perspective on it in science. It just came out last week. But pretty interesting bioengineering application combining optogenetics with stem cells for a, 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 a peripheral nerve uh, intervention in, in mice. And they did a pretty cool thing. They made uh, stem cells express channel rhodopsin, and then they differentiated them into uh, peripheral motor neurons. And so this is pretty cool. You can make human ES cells express uh, channel rhodopsins, and we showed that back in 2010, and you can get currents from the stem cells. And you can turn them into neurons and get action potentials, and, and that, uh, that was also shown back in 2010. What this group did just last week is they said, well, let's put in uh, these embryoid body graphs of neurons, uh, of, of cells that have been differentiated toward the neural lineage. We're going to implant them directly into the uh, the uh, nerve, and they're going to regrow as peripheral axons will do, okay? So they're going to send out their nerves and innervate the target muscle. Now they won't have, since we're injecting right into the nerve, they won't have synapses. They're not going to be controlled by the brain anymore. So that's okay. We're going to control them uh, with light. So we're going to come in and put a cuff around there, and now we've got, uh, and they indeed showed that, this characteristic fatigue resistant pattern compared to the fatiguing electrical stimulation. So it's a combination stem cell optogenetic uh, control tool for peripheral nervous system. Teams did a great job. Um, Going to reveal a little more about the case now. It's kind of exciting. This is how things normally go. Uh, information comes in slowly. You've already seen this. This is our 26-year-old woman. Headache, inability to communicate, behavioral changes, abnormal movements. You already know how quickly things deteriorated, seizing and then became unresponsive to all stimuli. Okay. What's going on? Well, um, in thinking about this case, the physician will consider how focal is it, how asymmetric is it, 
How widespread is it? And the first thing you note here is how widespread and symmetrical the changes are. And that argues against a stroke, which tends to be more focal or what we call uh, lateralizing. Uh, eye deviation uh, to one side, not the other. Focal lesion or injury, not too well supported here. The other interesting thing, in addition to the symmetry, uh, it was not, it was, it was somewhat fluctuating, uh, but uh, rapidly uh, progressive, okay? And so this, uh, the, the fact that it was symmetric also argued against very aggressive focal cancers, focal demyelination, focal vascular or blood supply issues. But a lot of very destructive, progressive things wouldn't uh, fluctuate that way. They wouldn't uh, 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 restore function uh, in a spontaneous way, even superimposed on an overall deterioration. So it was thought that demyelination, vascular, and aggressive cancers were not likely to be involved. If you look at the combination of behavioral and memory problems, that points to the so-called limbic system, which is a part of the brain that uh, controls memory, including the hippocampus. This is also a part of the brain that, has the, that is most seizure prone, and we know she had uh, uh, at least one seizure in the hospital. But the confusing thing was other signs pointed away from the, the hippocampus and toward the brain stem. There were uh, changes in mood and uh, autonomic abnormalities, and she became completely unresponsive. So it wasn't just memory, it was very global. So we had this uh, uh, very widespread uh, uh, picture. Okay, so that was a little more in terms of clinical thinking. What about lab tests? Toxicology was interesting. There was barbiturate positivity, there was THC, there was alcohol, okay. But none of these by themselves explained the symptoms. Negative for Lyme, negative for syphilis, heavy metals, negative. Cultures of blood and sputum, negative. Urine only showed yeast, nothing serious. Antibiotics were given, proved the yeast, but nothing else helped, okay. More diagnostics. MRI scan of the brain, everybody's curious about that, right? Looked basically normal, nothing that could really be picked up. Mild sinus issues. CT of the brain, no intracranial hemorrhage, no tumor that you could pick up. Uh, normal blood supply, carotids, vertebrals, and cerebral arteries. CT angiography is filling the blood vessels with a contrast dye so you can see the form of all the cells. Chest x-ray, basically normal. There's what we call focal consolidation, which means sometimes people who are hospitalized for a while will get a slight collapse of part of the lung. That's called atelectasis. It can look a little bit like pneumonia. In any case, that can be treated. Uh, could not explain the symptoms. Nothing serious on x-ray. EEG, uh, diffuse slowing. We see this sometimes on EEG. It's not very helpful in diagnosing, but it shows there is a problem in the brain, but we knew that already, um, so not a huge help. But there was not as if there was an ongoing seizure activity. Sometimes that happens, we call that status epilepticus, where there's always a seizure going on all the time and you can become unresponsive for that reason. She had a seizure, but not ongoing seizures. So that did not explain her, her symptoms. Echocardiography, transthoracic, using ultrasound to look at the heart. Why'd they do that? Well, it was normal, so it doesn't matter, but I'll tell you sometimes People who have strokes, they, there can be abnormalities in the heart. There can be a clot or a thrombus that's throwing off particles that ends up clotting bus, bus, uh, blood vessels in the brain. Not the case here, totally normal. Okay, then some things were seen, okay. Out of left field, CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis, okay, revealed a lesion. A 1.6 centimeter lesion in the left ovary that contained fat and calcifications consistent with what's called a dermoid cyst. Okay, so then bring in ultrasound of the pelvis. It's hyperechogenic, which means it shows up very well on ultrasound. Um, fat and calcification, consistent with a dermoid cyst. I'll tell you more about what that is in a minute. Okay, blood tests of a whole bunch of things. Almost everything normal. Uh, a lot of things that could go wrong. Copper, heavy metal, thyroid, all normal. Voltage-gated potassium channel antibodies, normal. Nothing seen there. Uh, antibodies to some antineuronal things, analogous to what we've talked about before, normal. But lumbar puncture, looking at the cerebral spinal fluid, which you can access here, but it's the same fluid that's circulating here, showed a few interesting things. Pleocytosis, cells. Normally there's not a lot of cells in cerebrospinal fluid, but there are cells. 
And here, antibodies to the NMDA receptor. Okay, so that's pretty interesting. What's going on there? And this is just what some of the imaging looks like, ultrasound of the pelvis showing this little hyper echogenic region. Okay, so you go in, you take a look at it, and the reason you are suspicious now is there's a syndrome called limbic encephalitis, which is paraneoplastic. That means it occurs in the setting of a neoplasm or cancer. This happens, it's like the small cell lung cancer that we talked about earlier that can lead to the production of antibodies. You can actually have a non-neural tumor that ends up making a protein that the immune system's not used to seeing there in that location and ends up creating a, uh, an immune response too, and it creates an autoimmune attack. And so in her dermoid cyst, she had all kinds of different stuff going on. There, were, there was neural tissue, a little bit of neuroepithelial tissue. There was fat, there was cartilage as shown in blue. So this is, a, in, particularly in the ovary, in these uh, reproductive uh, zones of the body, there's a particular plasticity. You can actually create tumors spontaneously that make tissues corresponding to many different parts of the body, including uh, the nervous system. And so she had a dermoid cyst that was making tissues corresponding to all different parts of the body, including neural tissue, and therefore including NMDA receptors. And the immune system then created antibodies to uh, the receptor. What does that do? Well, then you've got antibodies that manage to leak their way into the hippocampus, uh, into the CNS overall. That explains the sort of symmetric global effect, uh, both brainstem, limbic system. Uh, seizure probably originated here. You could actually see uh, staining for antibodies to the NMDA receptor using the patient's uh, serum. You can get different kinds of things. It's, it's not always an NMDA receptor antibody. Sometimes it's potassium channels. Sometimes it's other neural targets. Um, but in her case, it was an NMDA receptor finding. And so the diagnosis then is limbic encephalitis. This fits every part of her diagnosis and course in a, in a perfect way. Um, if you're interested, there was a really recent book called uh, Brain on Fire, which is a, some of you might have heard about. It got a lot of uh, press a, a year or so ago. It was written by somebody who had one of these syndromes, and she actually describes the psychosis that she was experiencing at the time, really uh, uh, psychotic as a result of this uh, NMDA receptor-dependent limbic encephalitis. The course of it is you have a severe headache, uh, neck pain, malaise. It can look like meningitis, often in young women. You get mood changes, then serious thought disorder, disordered thinking, incomprehensible speech, confusion, hallucinations, then seizures, decreasing consciousness. You can have this sort of unresponsive state that the patient had. In psychiatry, we call it catatonia. Neurologists call it akinetic mutism. It's the same thing. You get increased muscle tone, increased activity overall, facial dyskinesias, abnormal movements, everything's being activated abnormally. NMDA receptor being driven in some cases by some antibodies, so you actually can actually open the channel and allow ions to flow through. It's not just that it's dysfunctional, it can be hyperfunctional. Without treatment, you get respiratory failure and death. EEG was consistent, that diffuse slowing uh, was, was consistent. MRI and CT looking normal is completely expected as well because you can't see the brain. Root cause, it's, it's like a cancer. It's a, the dermoid cyst was the initial thing and that was a, a proliferation that's, that's cancer-like. Hyperproliferation. And the, in this case, the uh, lumbar puncture was very severe. So anti-NMD receptor antibody needed perineoplastic limbic encephalitis associated with ovarian carcinoma. So actually, uh, one, of, one of the groups actually had that on their differential, which is pretty impressive. But the reason we picked this as an initial uh, case was uh, it, it kind of shows how you need to look at the whole body together. I mean, who would have thought there was you know, a cyst in the ovary based on this patient's uh, CNS findings? So it shows how everything's interrelated. It highlights immune, cancer, CNS function. So your task next is uh, to think about possible treatments, okay? Think about the antibody, think about the immune system, think about the cyst, uh, how you would treat it. Uh, and uh, again, simple, short, uh, 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 try to hit the heart of the matter. It may not be as simple as you might think, uh, but uh, and we'll tell you what happened with this patient and how treatment uh, and response progressed.
Okay, any questions on that? I, I would say, you know, you're going to have not just one thing, you're going to have a list of uh, possible treatments and I would give a justification for each one and a little bit maybe on the sequencing, you know, we would do yeah. this first uh, and then based on that we would do this, okay? Again, one sentence, a little bit of justification for each intervention that you might give. All right, great.